Good morning, uh, everyone. It's uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the Center for European Legal Studies and the Ukrainian Catholic University School of Law joint webinar on the impact of Russia's illegal war against Ukraine on the EU legal order. My name is Marcus Gehring. I uh, was director of the Center for European Legal Studies, and I'm going to chair this webinar this morning or afternoon, depending on your time zone. It gives me uh, enormous pleasure to host uh, not just our distinguished speaker, Dr. Luigi Leonardo, uh, but also our colleagues from the Ukrainian Catholic University based in Lviv, um, Dr. Natalia uh, Haletska, uh, who is going to welcome us. And I will later introduce Professor Taras Leshkovich uh, and uh, Dr. Maxim uh, Koliba uh, as respondents to our speaker. Um, Natalia is a senior lecturer at uh, the Ukrainian Catholic University School of Law. She's chair of uh, the Commission of European Integration and International Cooperation at the Lviv Regional Council. And she's a member of the Lviv Regional Board of the Ukrainian Bar Association. Uh, Dr. Halitska, um, Natalia, you've got the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleagues, it is my distinct pleasure to be here and to open a very important webinar. This is a webinar which starts a very fruitful cooperation between the Cambridge University Center of European Legal Studies and the Ukrainian Catholic University School of Law. Indeed, since the full-scale Russian, uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine in February 2022, much has been written, many articles, many books, but the book we will be discussing today is really an important piece of research which lays a very interesting foundations to be discussed. It combines legal analysis with a political, diplomatic analysis, with analysis how all we can win, how can we move closer the peace and stability and the victory of Ukraine. This is a really very important discussion. So um, it is my pleasure that we can join our efforts in this mutually beneficial discussion and further uh, and further uh, make our victory closer. So I um, thank thank you for in, so thank you for inviting uh, for inviting us, and I wish all of you a very fruitful discussion, which can result in further and future publications. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I should also welcome you all uh, on behalf of the CELS uh, co-directors, uh, Professor Oko Dudu and Dr. Emilia Linata to this uh, important event going forward. Our uh, speaker for uh, today is Dr. Luigi Leonardo. He's a lecturer in law at University College York, uh, Cork in Ireland, and a visiting lecturer in foreign, uh, European foreign security and defense policy at Sciences Po in Paris, France. He joined Cork after completing his PhD in European Union law at King's College London. He's the author of EU Common Foreign and Security Policy after Lisbon between law and geopolitics. And his most recent publication that he's going to introduce to us today, uh, Russia's uh, 2022 war against Ukraine and the EU foreign policy reaction uh, published earlier this year. Uh, Dr. Leonardo, you have the floor. Thank you, 
thank you for the invitation. It is a, a pleasure to be part of the conversation and in fact to kick off the discussion. And let me express my gratitude to the Center for European Legal Studies in Cambridge and to the colleagues of the Ukrainian uh, Catholic Universities for uh, joining uh, and discussing uh, today's presentation. What I'm going to do today is to um, give uh, um, brief overview of the impact of the war on the legal order of the European Union. And in doing so, I will uh, introduce briefly the object and purpose of the book that was very kindly recalled um, in the introduction, but I'm also genuinely interested in going beyond what is in the book. And uh, um, for that reason, I am going to focus uh, 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 on the perspective of the European Union, although I shall have inevitably something to say also about the United Kingdom and the United States, and I will say very little about uh, Ukraine itself, because I would like to leave this for the uh, discussion. So my talk today will proceed in uh, three points. First, I will introduce the object and purpose of the book and its main arguments. I will then say one thing about the political impact on the war and focus most of the presentation on the impact on the EU legal order. So why have I written this book and what is in this book? The rationale for it is to share scholarship. I thought I was in a good position to provide the EU foreign policy perspective because it is at the intersection between uh, my areas of scholarship and of uh, personal interests. Uh, it, the, the war is also an intellectually stimulating case study on complex causality because there are uh, desires and beliefs of individuals uh, who are involved in this. There are also uh, more general factors such as macroeconomics, geopolitics, and also the perceptions that nations have uh, about their own role in history and in geography. The purpose of the book is to offer my commentary um, and, uh, and to synthesize um, scholarship in three fields, uh, international relations, law, and uh, um, Russian studies. Um, it, the book does not seek to advance scholarship in three fields. It seeks to put together uh, insights from them in order to offer an introductory overview. And um, if I may, it was difficult in the book to uh, keep my strong emotions uh, down and to separate facts from interpretation, from my interpretation. Uh, but um, I think that um, I have endeavored to, that, to do that uh, as best as I could. Uh, having, having said that, what has the EU done? What is the EU foreign policy reaction? I think we can schematically dis distinguish three things. The EU has adopted uh, sanctions against Russia and Belarus, uh, in support of, uh, of Ukraine, uh, these sanctions were adopted in uh, uh, successive waves or packages, as the EU institutions call them. They are the harshest in the EU sanction history, uh, and um, they contain, as I will try to explain later, an element of constitutional experimentation. The EU has also provided humanitarian assistance. We can uh, recall the first uh, activation of the Temporary Protection Directive. Uh, the EU has also given uh, humanitarian uh, assistance to um, the neighboring countries to assist uh, with, the, um, with the immigration from uh, Ukraine. Uh, the EU has also provided financial assistance, both directly macroeconomic uh, assistance to Kyiv and uh, indirectly through financing the member states so that these would uh, uh, be able to transfer for free or uh, at a low price weapons to uh, Ukraine. The argument of the book is that th there are two arguments, really the reaction of the, um, of the EU to the war the reaction that I have just mentioned, is shaped by two constraints. One is military dependence on the US and NATO, which meant that no EU country wanted to 
take on Russia militarily alone. Uh, and the second is energy dependence on Russia, which which created the complex patterns of decision making when it came to sanctioning the Russian oil sectors. The reaction of the EU is therefore a compromise between these two constraints. Given these two limits, the, the choices of the EU were uh, oriented on offering a form of diplomatic uh, indirect support to Ukraine. And this leads me to the second argument of the, um, of the book, which is the one that I will develop in the rest of the presentation, that is that the reaction, the foreign policy reaction of the EU was not revol revolutionary in terms of institutional and legal structure. So in terms of actors, processes and tools, outcomes, the, um, the reaction of the EU was not uh, was nothing new, was not revolutionary, and this is despite EU rhetoric suggesting that instead it is so. However, I would like to compare this with the momentous political impact that the war has had, and I have one slide in which I have tried to summarize uh, the um, political impact uh, on the EU um, on the EU system. Um, we could mention the uh, accession process, the requests, the applications that were triggered essentially by the war, um, pushing us to reflect on the boundaries of Europe, since uh, Ukraine, uh, Republic of Moldova and Georgia have applied to be part of the EU in uh, 2022, and the first two of which have already been granted candidate status. Um, the, there is an impact of the war on European defence that is clear. The German Chancellor spoke about that Zeitenwende, an epochal turn um, when he announced that Germany would uh, do something that is quite, uh, quite a watershed in German history, uh, namely doubling defence budget, putting Germany among the top uh, um, spenders in absolute terms in the world after US and China. Um, uh, Finland and Sweden have uh, requested to join NATO. Uh, Finland's bid went to uh, came to fruition uh, a few weeks ago, and on Sweden, I think we are bound to wait the outcome of, of the Turkish election in a few days. Um, Denmark uh, held a referendum immediately a few months after the war to opt uh, in. Um, uh, defense uh, to opt in EU decisions with uh, defense implications. And there is also an, an unprecedented, I would say, um, showcase of solidarity between EU member states and between the member states and Ukraine, especially at the beginning of the war. Uh, it, I would say it is a surprising degree of consensus um, that was perhaps surprising even for uh, the Russian elite. Um, this, um, this is also a, a form of um, very close cooperation that we have seen uh, also with other countries in the West. For example, NATO uh, has uh, stepped up its support not only to Ukraine, but also has uh, deployed uh, troops in, uh, in, neighboring, in neighboring countries. And now I would focus on the impact on the EU legal order, which uh, I... Um, I would first need to, to, to justify why do we talk about law, uh, even though the violence of the war uh, is meant to dwarf or to put in the background the legal technicalities. And um, in a sense, it's because it's all more important now to remember um, legal considerations uh, the, in fact, uh, the view of um, the Russian president is that um, he, is that the actions are justified under international law. Um, Putin, in his speech, uh, um, refers to how the West, uh, Zapad, uh, in fact, invokes international law in order to hide American imperialism. So international law is very present in the Kremlin's rhetoric. And on the other hand, um, the notion of law is also very much present in uh, the EU's uh, rhetoric. This is because the EU is uh, based on the rule of law. And um, in fact, uh, the EU 
takes the view that everything that uh, Putin says uh, about international law is uh, uh, cynical. Uh, he, he does a disservice to the credibility of international law because, in fact, uh, Russia opposes a power-based and prestige-based views of international relations to the EU's views of a system of an international system as based on rules. So I think that law is uh, not merely a technicality, but it is elevated to a foundational element of international politics, and this is uh, what Putin had to say a couple of days ago on uh, the, the Day of Victory, um, celebrating the end of, of World War II. The, the Western globalist elite's goal is to break apart and destroy our country, to make null and void the outcomes of World War II, to completely break down the system of global security and international law, to choke off any sovereign centers of development. So there is uh, uh, what I would call a disappointment with uh, uh, the uses of international law and uh, what uh, uh, what he calls the abuses of the uh, UN uh, mm, uh, Security Council in the uses of, um, of international law that I discuss a bit in the book, and I'm happy to come back to that in the, uh, in the comments. Now, focusing on EU law, I would say that we could uh, distinguish three um, sectors of impact of the, e uh, of the war on the EU legal order. The first is that sanctions contain constitutional experiments. The second is that the Commission has adopted a, a temporary crisis framework uh, to, guarant to grant exceptions or derogations from the state aid regime. And the third is the interesting uh, administrative practices and experiments concerning a uh, um, visa ban for, uh, for Russians uh, entering the EU. I will focus on the first in the interests of time uh, and um, try to explain a bit more, try to tease out what I mean by constitutional uh, experiments. Uh, the sanctions uh, have um, mm, the sanctions that have been adopted uh, against Russia, uh, Belarus, uh, uh, and uh, um, and also certain Ukrainian individuals uh, um, have, uh, have do not present a revolutionary um, revolutionary characteristics in the sense that they have been adopted by the actors that the treaties have uh, um, put in charge of doing so uh, according to the standard uh, procedures uh, and they are the usual tools so in a sense the EU legal order and this would be my main uh, uh, take home point the EU legal order has withstood the impact in the sense that there have been no explicit or implicit constitutional amendments. And this can be contrasted with what had happened in reaction to the financial crisis of the previous decades, to the uh, migration crisis of 2015, uh, or to COVID, uh, where uh, what we have uh, witnessed was a form of hybrid action between the EU and the member states that blurred the boundaries between, uh, um, between the, the former and the latter. Um, it resulted in uh, uh, Legal, oper, oper, uh, work of legal engineering of international law uh, treaties that set up institutions that um, involved also EU institutions. So I'm thinking about the European Stability Mechanism, um, a, a treaty that uh, foresees uh, the uh, involvement of the European Commission and that these uh, um, um, questionable whether it is inside or outside the EU legal order um, uh, and um, or um, uh, adoption of um, uh, soft law instruments in which it is unclear whether it is adopted by the EU institutions or by the member states. And none of these happened in the case of the um, of the uh, of the war against Ukraine, with a possible. Uh, con considerable exception in, in terms of institutional developments, which is the European political community to which we might want to come back in the discussion. Uh, the sanctions, uh, however, which pursue the, the th threefold rationale of uh, 
making Russia's war sustaining effort materially impossible to protect the EU security and public order, as well as to signal uh, possibly to China a strong condemnation of Russia's behavior, um, do, course, do contain an element of constitutional experimentation. And what is the constitutional experimentation here? It is the pursuit of uh, a certain domestic policy through sanctions. And this is the first time that it has happened. Um, let me uh, focus on one of these policies in particular. It is the anti-disinformation policy. Other examples that I have mentioned that on which we can expand later if necessary are uh, criminal law and energy policy. But in the case of EU anti-disinformation policy, what the EU normally does is to adopt, er, adopt regu regulations or regulatory instruments uh, that can be binding or soft law um, that, that consists of uh, um, trying to uh, have the relevant social media adopt codes of conduct for uh, um, their own monitoring of illegal content. So EU anti-disinformation policy is usually the commission's uh, prerogative. It is an internal market matter and it is based on preemptive regulation. The sanctions against, um, against uh, Russia contain instead also a prohibition that is a, um, a ex post punishment um, to, um, uh, to, to prohibit uh, uh, illegal content uh, um, that is broadcasted by certain Russian-sponsored media outlets in the European Union. So the element of constitutional experimentation in the sanctions, the one that I highlight in this presentation, is uh, contained in the sanctions uh, against uh, uh, certain media outlets that are based in the EU. So the EU has censored EU-based companies because they were um, presenting um, they were presenting uh, um, uh, 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 content that the EU considers to be unlawful. They were presenting disinformation. And this is uh, absolutely a first time. It's interesting that this has uh, resulted already in a spectacular uh, judgment of the General Court. Uh, the judgment is T-125-22. Uh, RT France uh, and Council, the case is spectacular because uh, to my mind, it really tests how faithful a society is to its own values. The, it highlights uh, the question whether the European Union can restrict freedom of information, freedom of expression um, in order to preserve its public security and public order. In other words, the question that underlies this case, which is, I think, the question for uh, the European Union um, more generally, and as well as the other um, the other actors who have adopted sanctions, the United Kingdom and the United States, um, the question is how to square the EU's interests with the EU's values. In a sense, the uh, and I will conclude on this. Uh, the EU's, in, it might be in the EU's interest to stop the war uh, as fast as possible, uh, but stopping the war as soon as possible might mean to compromise with Russia, and compromising with Russia would uh, potentially entail a violation of the EU's values of respect of international law and of the uh, right to self determination of the Ukrainian, because immediately because ending the war might entail making territorial concessions to Russia. I think that the difficulty uh, is um, uh, as a matter of law uh, is how to square and how to balance EU interests and EU values. The EU primary law uh, does not give an um, it does not contain the balancing, does not contain the terms of the balancing. Uh, EU secondary law such as the sanctions, tries to strike a balance. So this is um, this is where I would uh, uh, conclude. Here is the, um, the practical effect of the sanctions on Russia. Russia now has its own 
that they cannot have McDonald's any longer. They don't use Instagram officially or, or Starbucks, but they have come up with their own version of McDonald's. Um, so this concludes my presentation. Again, thank you enormously um, for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luigi, and uh, also for uh, that uh, concluding thought. I, I think um, the uh, such a blatant attack on uh, the the global legal order as uh, we've seen perpetrated by uh, Russia uh, for the last um, uh, year and a half uh, has really challenged um, the 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 European Union. And uh, so it's um, really interesting for us uh, to then uh, see some of the reaction of uh, legal scholars based in Ukraine. And I should have perhaps emphasized that more. Um, we're hosting speakers today here in Cambridge uh, in our webinar uh, in from uh, a country that is under military attack, and it's almost, um, it's remarkable that uh, the, the scholars, the, the lecturers, the professors based in uh, Ukraine are continuing with their work and uh, contributing to the global discussion. So our first respondent is uh, Professor Taras uh, Lekovic, um, uh, he's uh, got a PhD in law and an LM from the Central European University, he's senior lecturer at the Ukrainian Catholic University School of Law and a senior project officer and local legal advisor of the Council of Europe office in uh, Ukraine. Uh, Professor Lechkovich, you've got the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for organizing this event, for bringing us all together. Um, thank you to all the participants who, who joined to, to listen to us discussing this, this book. Uh, and also thank you to Luigi for writing this, this highly relevant, this, this very important book, this, this very topical at the moment. Um, it is indeed relevant to to, to analyze um, the situation because, in my opinion, the um, the period of of war between Russia and Ukraine, starting from 2014 up until 2022, was very under research. Um, it didn't drag. Uh, it didn't attract as as much as attention as as it should have. Um, and um, it's not only in the scholarship, but also in the EU's reaction and in other states' reaction. Um, and that's that. That's where I want to to make this bridge to uh, Luigi's main claim that that the uh, reaction of EU was shaped by these these two uh, two constraints: dependence on military uh, military dependence on US and NATO, and energy emergency energy dependence on on Russia. Uh, and also the second claim that the EU's reaction was not was not revolutionary. Uh, I am not an expert on EU law, so I will provide uh, more of a perspective from general public international law point of view, as well as as some criminal um, international criminal law and criminal justice perspective. Uh, probably going a little bit beyond the book and, and, and providing some, apart from some comments on the book itself, providing some some additional uh, additional views um, to, to 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 the war in Ukraine. So first of all, that the the idea that EU's reaction was is not revolutionary, I, I completely agree, uh, and I, I I mostly I agree with both of your premises. Of course, I I would disagree, and I can discuss some of the points, but that's normal because. Uh, I think it would never happen that two lawyers would agree on everything. Lawyers tend to argue, lawyers tend to debate, to discuss things, to, to disagree on some minor points here and there. Uh, but largely, yes, I, I would agree. And I would say from my perspective as, as Ukrainian um, and as a legal scholar that EU's reaction was good, but it was too late. 
and it has been too late. Uh, unfortunately, it has been too late all the time. Um, and we see it in Ukraine uh, when there are discussions on transfer of some new type of, of military weapons to Ukraine. There is always this fear, fear that, no, we cannot do it because it would be an, uh, an escalation and, and we cannot do it. But then three months pass, this is done and there is no escalation whatsoever. But I mean, for these delays, we are paying with the lives of, of, of our citizens, of, of our people. Uh, in general, yes, um, EU's reaction, sanctions, uh, military assistance, financial assistance, humanitarian assistance, um, indeed, and I agree with, with what you claim, that the, the reaction was uh, stronger than probably Putin expected, um, and it was stronger than, than many people in Ukraine ex expected, uh, because we were afraid that there might be a repetition of what has happened in 2014, that after the annexation of Crimea, there were some sanctions imposed on Russia, but those sanctions were uh, also significant, but not nearly significant enough to stop them from escalating further. So the reaction, yes, the reaction is good, but it's at least eight years too late. And if you speak from someone from Georgia, they will tell you that it's at least 15 years too late or 14 years too late, because Russia was always um, allowed to continue with, with their violations. And... Uh, Russia has used plethora of, of legal justification of, of uh, the annexation of Crimea and then some new explanation after the so-called special military operation in, in February 2022. Sometimes these justifications are mutually exclusive, but that's, that's also type of the strategy that they use, that you present as many explanations as possible, and then you leave it to your opponent to argue with each of those explanations. Starting from 2014, they first claimed that they are not present in Crimea. Those were not us. We are not there. Those, these are local people uh, who are fighting against uh, Junta in Kiev or this Nazi regime in Kiev. Then they claimed that, yes, we are here, but we are doing it by the invitation of the legitimate president Yanukovych, who asked us to intervene. Then they were claiming that we are trying to defend Russian nationals abroad or Russian speaking minority abroad. And we are simply recognizing the legitimate will of, of people who decided to, to use their right for self-determination. They cite Kosovo precedents while not recognizing Kosovo precedent itself. So mutually exclusive explanations, mutually exclusive justifications, uh, trying to simply um, create the confusion and put the burden of, of, of arguing on, on the opponent. Uh, some of the points from, from your book, um, and they are indeed not, not main thesis, but because I agree with those, uh, uh, some of the questions that, that you raised, uh, for example, you're asking in your book that, that EU does not have Russia strategy and that e EU did not have Russia strategy before the, this full-scale invasion started, and their reaction was partially uh, based on the fact that there was no Russia strategy. And, and it is true, there is no Russia, in my opinion, there is no clear Russia strategy right now. Uh, or for what is already sometimes discussed in Ukraine, there is no post-Russia strategy. So no one in the West or no one outside of, of our region even comprehend the idea that, that Russia in the form as it is today, this huge colonial empire, because it still is, territorially an empire, and you write it yourself, that this territorial expansion of Russia throughout history in this multi-ethnic character, uh, nobody can even comprehend that it might happen in a year, in two years, in five years, in 10 years, that, that Russia might collapse and some new countries might be established in, 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 that, uh, in that place. Uh, and it might so, sound outrageous at the moment to even say so, the same already happened 30 years ago or 32 years ago when Soviet Union collapsed a few years before. Nobody believed that this would happen. And we know it personally from our own history, because when President Bush at the time arrived in Kiev in July 1991, he gave this speech, which we dubbed now Chicken Kiev, because he was asking Ukraine not to leave Soviet Union. He was saying that Soviet Union is the only way to go because we may not allow that new states will be created instead of this, this one country, and then you will have to deal with all those states, and different states might have nuclear weapons, so that's scary. So the same is essentially happening right now. Nobody is, is even 
talking about it and i'm not sure if anybody is even thinking about the theoretical possibility of of this this happening uh and this this this, this actually might happen and and this also leads to this um idea that uh russia's behavior is partially or could be partially explained by uh by the fact that russia was humiliated in the 90s um, and it is a widely perceived idea in the Western scholarship, in the political circle, um, in the media, that, that in the 90s, after the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia was somehow humiliated. And again, this is something that is very different for us in, in this Eastern European region, in Ukraine, in the Baltic states, in Poland. Um, because for us, in, historically, we see, this, we, we see this situation much closer and, and, and we probably have better insight into what, what has been happening and what is happening. Uh, so for us, Russia was not humiliated. Russia received unprecedented amount of, of investment. Russia received unprecedented amount of support with democratization throughout the 90s. Russia was allowed to stay on the Security Council, so nobody even questioned that Russia will continue to be a permanent member on the Security Council. Russia was a partner of NATO throughout the 90s, which again is sometimes forgotten, especially now when they claim that NATO is somehow tricked Horbachev and promised never to expand, which Horbachev himself disproved in one of his interviews. Uh, so yeah, it's it, it's a very interesting um, it's a very interesting book, um, uh, uh, and I understand when you say that this is an intellectually appealing topic to to write on. I, indeed, I agree, I agree with you, uh, and I understand that that motivation. Uh, and what I would also like to add uh, from my from my professional perspective related more to criminal justice uh, uh, of what EU has done uh, already in in this area, the, you did not explore that 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 in your book, um, at least not not in detail. But EU has has been actually quite active in this in this area, especially related to international criminal justice. Uh, so there are two, essentially there are two layers. One is what EU and EU institution have been doing uh, within Ukraine, uh, providing capacity development support to Ukrainian uh, government. Uh, and the EU has been present uh, or has increased its presence in Ukraine uh, in 2014. So apart from EU delegation, which is essentially a diplomatic uh, body, uh, we have uh, EU advisory mission, uh, which provides support uh, with regards to civilian security sector reform. And before full-scale invasion, they focused uh, exclusively on law enforcement, on criminal justice system, on judiciary. Uh, they never worked with anything closely related to the military. So after mm, the full-scale invasion, they've also expanded into international crimes, into providing support with documentation, with prosecutions, with investigations. This is not something that, that, that they have been doing before. Same actually with the Council of Europe, but that's that's another organization. We will not go there uh, today. Um, there's also another project called EU Pravo Justice. They also provide support with that, but that's on national level. So they help Ukrainian authorities to deal with the situation. Uh, on the international level, on the EU level, Eurojust has been quite active in that sense. Um, so already back in March uh, 2022, so more than a year ago, uh, a joint investigation team was created by Ukraine, Poland and Lithuania uh, under the framework of, of Eurojust. So the idea was that um, these countries will provide support to Ukraine in, in investigations of, of war crimes or war related crimes more generally. Uh, later, Estonia, uh, Latvia, and Slovakia joined, and then Romania also joined. So this, this joint investigative team now includes seven countries, plus Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court joined this essentially as, as observer. Uh, so the idea is to help Ukraine with collecting evidence because tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of refugees are outside Ukraine who are potentially victims or witnesses of, of war-related crimes. Uh, so the idea is that they will provide support uh, with collecting evidence and potentially even bringing cases to trial. Uh, another aspect of this international support from the EU is that um, EU has been quite active in providing support with establishment of special tribunal for the crime of aggression uh, against Ukraine. Um, so due to jurisdictional constraints, the International Criminal Court cannot um, prosecute crime of aggression. 
uh, and Ukraine as a state cannot prosecute the crime of aggression against uh, high, highest level officials of Russia due to head of state immunity. So Ukraine cannot prosecute president or, or prime minister or minister of foreign affairs. So there is these discussions right now about the establishment of a special tribunal and EU has been very vocal and very uh, active in that sense. Uh, so it is not clear yet what specific model will be chosen, whether the, the tribunal will be established, but what has already been uh, done is um, the declaration by the European Parliament supporting the idea of establishment of the tribunal. Um, similar declarations were adopted by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, by NATO Parliamentary Assembly, uh, and also the EU went a little bit beyond that. Um, and the International Center for the Prosecution of the Crime of Aggression was established again under the auspices of the Eurojust. Uh, so the idea is that this center will start, will be collecting evidence, will be uh, paving the way for, for the tribunal that hopefully will be established uh, in the future. I think I will stop here. Um, thank you once again, Luigi, for for writing the book. Um, it was um, it was very interesting to read. I enjoyed reading it actually, uh, the same as 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 I enjoy being part of of this discussion. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Taras. Um, uh, fantastic to uh, hear your thoughts uh, on on this, and I completely agree um uh the 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 crime of aggression uh clearly perpetrated at the highest level of uh the current russian federation government uh has to be uh, prosecuted and uh i say that uh coming uh from a country um that uh basically through the nuremberg trials only came to turn with the scale and scope of the crimes committed in neighboring countries. So uh, moving right forward, um, our next speaker is Dr. Maxim uh, Kaliba. Uh, he's senior lecturer at the Ukrainian Catholic University School of Law. He's also serving as deputy director uh, for administrative affairs and development at the International Institute for Ethics and contemporary issues. Uh, Maxime, you have the floor. You're muted. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to discuss the book. It is an honor to be here with you. I also consider it very uh, important that the issue of the Russian-Ukrainian war is considered at an uh, economic level in Europe. This is really a topic that will require a lot of research in various fields, including uh, the legal field. My speech will be quite similar to Taras' speech, um, but it will focus more on the historical and philosophical foundations of the functioning of the Russian Federation and its relations with Ukraine since I'm a philosopher of law. Um, I very much agree with the uh, assessment and description of the legal actions of the EU regarding Russia, sanctions and relations. They are truly unprecedented and very important uh, for the, to end this war. However, I would like uh, to put the main emphasis on the book itself and on the general perception of the Russian Federation in the Western world, especially in Western Europe. A red thread running through the entire text, uh, as I saw, maybe I'm wrong, is the idea that in any case it is necessary to think about future relations with Russia and uh, a force to connect it with Europe, because otherwise China will strengthen its forces. I see the logic uh, in the Dr. Leonardo's conclusions, especially given the desire for long-term peace in Europe. However, if the conclusions can be correct, then I see some incorrect premises, which accordingly give rise to incorrect results of reasoning. Western policies, uh, in general after the Second World War and after the collapse of the Soviet Union, for various reasons act as if Russia is on the same level of understanding of politics and society as the countries of the West and on the same level of understanding of human rights and freedoms, as well as democracy. So the 
the perception of Russia as a national state like France, Italy, Germany, or the UK. Instead, we in U Ukraine, like the Baltic countries and Poland, understand such an error of such a perception. Because Russia is not a national democratic state. Russia is an empire that did not completely disintegrate after the First World War, as did the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire. In 1917, the Bolsheviks became the fuse of disintegration. And through terror, they transformed the state from revolutionary disintegration to the most centralized apparatus. Under the guise of fake republics, after the destruction of independent, really independent national entities, a union which uh, had to be confederation was allegedly formed. Also, in fact, the vertical of one party and one leader was centralized. After the announcement of the creation of the Soviet Union, there were thousands of rebellions against the authorities on the territory of Ukraine until the uh, 1930s, which resulted in an artificial famine over the more. Thanks to it, the Soviet government succeeded in suppressing the resistance of the Ukrainian people against collectivism and the Soviet Union in itself. To understand Russia, uh, in my opinion, it is not necessary to appeal to the desire for eternal peace which came thanks to the leaders of France and Germany in the 40s and 50s, in the last century, because Russia never had a desire for eternal peace. On the contrary, it was Stalin together with Hitler who started the Second World War, not Hitler alone. It was Stalin who, as a result of the war, gained more territory, not the United States and its allies. In my point of view, there is uh, in the Western world, uh, I see there, there must be no reason to look the, for the causes for Russia's war aggression against Ukraine in their explanations and justifications. Throughout human history, most aggressors did not want to be seen as aggressors. All had justifications, whether historical, mythical, occult, or religious. However, one way or another, an aggressive war uh, was carried out. For better understanding of Russian imperialism, we can look at recent history, the 19th of the 20th century, uh, about uh, what uh, Taras uh, was saying. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia immediately included the mechanisms of inter-ethnic or pseudo-ethnic conflicts in the post-Soviet space. Transnistria, 1992, Karabakh, 1991, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, 1992, and later, Russia recognized part of all of these quasi-states, and Transnistria uh, once asked to be included in Russia. Subsequently, this same scenario was created on the territory of Ukraine. Uh, terrorist organizations here in Ukraine, uh, DNR and DNR, so Donetsk and Luhansk People Republic. During the democratic years of 1990s, Russia did not allow Tatarstan which voted for independence to secede from its composition and military pre prevented the exit of Chechnya and Dagestan. And all these things happened before Putin. The issue of Crimea was raised not only in 2014, but also in 1993. It's not about what NATO does or doesn't do or whether anyone gave any guarantees which there weren't. The point is how one understands sovereignty. The West predominantly understands sovereignty as a quality that is obtained and realized through civil society, the rule of law, and international law. Russia understands this as the will of the king or anyone in a high position. China adheres to a similar concept of sovereignty, but it is the main party here, the party there in, in China, although Xi Jinping's uh, course towards the centralization of power is now clearly visible. According to Ukraine, as a country of past, as we believe, considers sovereignty to be the will of the Ukrainian people, which legally chooses the government, which is divided into three branches. And this government fulfills its promises, which Ukrainians want to see. Today, it is the EU and NATO. On the other hand, there are no elections in Russia as such, despite the fact that officially it should be a federation. In fact, the only leader for more than 20 years, the destruction of the institution of election of governors and mayors, support for the one true policy is not the result of propaganda alone. The choice of imperial policy associated with the 19th or even 17th century is a regularity. 
Throughout its history, from Peter I to today, Russia has had only two serious periods of democracy. The first is February, October 1917. The second is 1991, 2000. In the first case, it was the Russian people who supported the Bolshevik dictatorship of the proletariat. In the second case, they elected Putin, who was KGB agent. We must understand that there are other worlds in the world besides the Western one, which offers a wide range of democratic opportunities. There is China and one and a half billion people who support the idea of sovereign great powers, where smaller ones should be in their orbit. There are many millions of people to whom Sharia norms are normal. And there is Russia, for which it is normal to renounce the prime primacy of international law, for which it is normal to leave the number of participants of the European Convention on Human Rights. Also, as a lawyers, we have to be precise in voting because they create a consequences that can legitimize unacceptable things. For example, there was no referendum in Crimea in 2014. Because in order for this to happen, at least there should be appropriate legislation. And I must remind about the unlegal presence of the military of the Russian Federation. Uh, there is also no concept of uh, the Donbass because it is only an old definition of a uh, coal basin. In addition, uh, so called the NR and the LNR, this public uh, uh, People Republic, recognized by Ukraine as a terrorist organization, operated only in a few districts in Donetsk and Luhansk regions. Instead, Donbass extends to the Zaporizhia region and part of Russian Federation. After all, um, I suppose that we can all agree with this. Uh, how can Europe think about business as usual with those uh, who killed 23 six, six children with rockets and drones on 28th of April in Uman? And those who already killed thousands of innocent people, including at least 500 of children. It is in accordance with European values to negotiate with terrorists. I don't think so. After all, this is terror, not just a war of one military against one another. So I must conclude. Uh, yes, there should be such studies because after all, we will somehow have to live together. We are extremely grateful to the EU and other partners for financial, social, and military assistance. Help, not assistance. Without it, we probably wouldn't have been able to last so long. Thank you for perceiving Ukraine as a part of the West and as a defender of freedoms important to the West. However, Russia is not a sacred cow that cannot be condemned. For today, after a year and almost three months of a full-scale invasion, any planning for the future must be based on one constant, in my point of view, Russia is a terrorist state. Because if we leave this racism unpunished, if we forget the crimes that have characteristics of genocide of Ukrainians, we will thereby give the opportunity to other regimes and other countries with imperial attitudes to act freely outside the legal field in and outside international law. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm done. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maxim. That uh, was very clear. And, you know, we we recognize that there are very few countries that have their uh, head of state, the president, indicted before the International Criminal Court. Um, of course, uh, that um, it, uh, what I would like to do is briefly uh, give the floor back to Luigi uh, to give us some brief reactions and then open up uh, the question and answer session. Uh, Luigi. Thank you, uh, Taras. Thank you, Maxim, uh, for your comments. I think it, it's an excellent uh, uh, start of the debate because, uh, because the debate is what I think we should be having. Um, uh, there, uh, sorry, Maxim, you were... Uh, um, you were sensitive enough not to call into question my conclusions, but but only the reasoning. However, I think that we disagree on on the conclusion, not on the premises. We we draw different conclusions from the same premises. Um, I I, I mentioned uh, Uvarov, Striad, uh, Samudashavie, Narodnost, uh, 
and uh, Pravdlavia uh, on the Samodarjavia, we are entirely there. Uh, we agree the tradition of constitutional democracy that was experienced in Western Europe from the end of the 18th century onward is foreign to the Russian tradition. Uh, this, the 1917 revolution has not brought that um, to Russia. Uh, R Russia has not experienced it, uh, um, not even in um, in the 90s, not to the same uh, extent as the West does. So they uh, that's that's why I mentioned the role of Russia in history or its self perception in history. Um, there is an important. Um, um doctrine an important idea in russian international political thought that justifies the role of russia as the defender of uh, um of a model that is in antithesis to the constitutional uh, um, rights based uh, uh, understanding uh, of the the rule of law that that the that the, uh, uh, france and uh, and england have uh, um, have established as the Orthodox in Western Europe, but for me that is not uh, uh, that is not a reason uh, not to be confident that the model established in France and England and then uh, copied uh, more or less successfully in Western Europe and now in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, so it's not a reason not to be confident that that model uh, produces better results for people and citizens, and therefore that, that model cannot be at the basis of a constructive dialogue. And the question is, how, how much can you insist on that model in the face of obvious resistance? And as a lawyer, that is the that that is a question that I try to that I try to argue with in relation to what the fundamental texts of the European Union, so the fundamental treaties of the European Union tell me, I don't think that there is an answer there. So this is why the, the debate is uh, is very important. And this also links to the um, to the point that Taras was uh, mentioning. Of course, uh, I, I don't dedicate much attention to uh, the efforts of the European External Action Service in cooperation, in cooperating with international institutions, with the ICC. Um, you're entirely correct, and you, you have uh, obviously already recalled the um, the main steps of this cooperation, including the European Parliament resolution for the establishment of an ad hoc tribunal considering the um, the jurisdictional limits of the of the ICC on that um, it is um, it is not just a question of law there of course there is also a question as always with international criminal justice of political opportunity um, there is an inherent tension in the goal of uh, international criminal justice uh, uh, between uh, um, between the promise of retribution, the promise of satisfaction to the victim, and of course the aim to um, end hostilities. In other words, uh, one could take the cynical view that the in, in, uh, arrest warrant uh, against uh, Putin makes it more difficult for leaders to be seen negotiating with Putin. Although I repeat, I think that at some point it is um, it is um, too obviously in the interests of uh, at least of the European Union uh, to um, to sit down at a table uh, with the Russian leaders. Uh, however, it doesn't necessarily need to be the current Russian leadership, uh, that, and that uh, um, that, however, opens up uh, a completely different world of speculation. I, I think in the book I mentioned a 1917 scenario in which a provisional government would need to accept anything just in order to end the hostilities. But uh, but at the moment, that's um, that's pure speculation from my side. So thank you enormously and very much looking forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luigi. And um, let's open up the floor uh, to questions. I'm personally very grateful that no one sat down with Hitler to negotiate 
uh, peace in Europe uh, during the Second World War, but um, they did before though. No, they did until until well, 59. they 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 tried and they were um, you know deceived uh, actively, and I think that's the state we're in uh, with regards to the Russian Federation at the moment. Um, but uh, be that as it may, and it's not uh, exactly uh, my area. Let's let's come back to the uh, European Union and what this uh, clear challenge means for the U European Union. Um, could I uh, could I invite questions? Uh, and I know uh, Natalia has been uh, waiting to to ask a question. Natalia, go ahead. And and oh, I should invite the audience to please use the Q and A button uh, for their questions. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I um, indeed, this book is a very interesting example of multidisciplinary research, and it was a very interesting intellectual exercise for me. I totally side with my colleagues who have discussed this book from philosophic point of view, international criminal law point of view. I would add my five cents from the international economic law point of view. And the main question in my in my view is what is the point when the when the Russian aggression against Ukraine has started? One may say it's 2022. And one may say 2014. I would suggest the date 2013, and I would explain why is it so. Starting from 2013, Russia has started putting an economic pressure on Ukraine, starting chocolate wars, cheese wars, putting a pressure on Ukrainian exporters, and totally stopping exports from Ukraine to other countries of the Commonwealth of Independent States. And at that point of time, uh, it is important to know that European market was closed for Ukrainian products because we. We didn't have free trade agreement with the European Union, so no, what it was or it was traditional trade flows through Russia to other countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and many many others. And Russia starts putting this pressure on Ukraine, economic pressure, just to make sure Ukraine will be in the orbit of Russia. So is this an aggression? Definitely, this is an economic aggression. And later we received a uh, physical aggression, military aggression in 2014, which was, in my opinion, a natural continuation of this economic pressure. So Ukraine has withstood this economic pressure and indeed, signed the, the yeah, association agreement, and this was the right sign. And later, do we receive an appropriate response from the European Union? Judging from this history of the economic pressure, it's disputable. Because uh, whether the sanctions were harsh enough in order to stop Russia from continuing military, uh, from continuing military operations in Ukraine, that is also a, ve a very difficult question to answer. If we judge only response of the European Union starting from 2022, I think it will be a very narrow point of view. I think it's important to judge starting from the 2014 in order to fully understand what was actually happening. And if we, and if we analyze Russia sections and the European Union response from the 20. 14, we can understand that some words that Putin is saying are just the cover for his, some commercial and mercantile interests. And that's why we receive this blockade of seaports. That's why we, we, we see that the main idea of the Russian leader is to make Ukraine a failed state, to show that Ukraine is economically unviable. And that's, uh, that's why we appreciate very much. We are very grateful to the European Union for the response but we humbly are saying that uh, this response could have been harsh in 2014, and that's why it will be much easier right now to deal with to deal with Russia. So one, my, I have two questions, and my first question is: Can we really interpret Putin's words directly, or maybe we can just understand them as a cover for something else, and that can shape our legal response and political response? And my second question is on a different area. In 1994, Ukraine has signed Budapest memorandum and gave away its uh, its nuclear power. And definitely, uh, all member current member states of the European Union supported this idea, and um, and Ukraine performed its obligations and Union gave all its uh, uh, some of its missiles to Russia. And now we receive an aggression from Russia. So did. 
The fact that Ukraine signed with the Pest Memorandum, and maybe it was a wrong policy choice for the U European Union members to support at that time signing of this Budapest Memorandum, shaped the European Union response to, uh, to the aggression of Ukraine. So these are two my questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Natalia. And uh, before I give the floor back, um, I'd like to to ask a question um, to 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 all three three uh, speakers. Um, what they expect the next steps are going to be, right? So um, uh, we all know that um, formal negotiations for accession could start very soon. Uh, Ukraine has the status now of a candidate country, uh, which is, uh, as Luigi said, unprecedented in terms of the time frame. I'm uh, expecting a few more firsts. I'm uh, very confident that um, in the not too distant future, we'll see uh, Ukraine as a full-fledged member of uh, the European Union. And I was wondering whether, like um, what the effect of having Ukraine as an EU member state would be on the EU legal order and uh, the, the especially the foreign policy of the European Union. So if you had a crystal ball, how would Ukraine's EU membership shape uh, EU foreign policy towards the rest of the world is my question. Uh, Luigi, if we start with you, uh, two very challenging questions uh, from Natalia. And uh, one maybe um, slightly more softball question for me. Go ahead, uh, Luigi. And uh, we need to keep um, answers relatively short. I apologize. We're slowly running out of time. I'll try to be as short as possible. Uh, the response to the Budapest Memoranda has shaped the EU policy. I would say the Budapest Memoranda were the were perfectly in line with history at the moment. There was nothing surprising with countries renouncing nuclear weapons. Um, it was, uh, in fact, um, the main. Uh, issue of cooperation, uh, the main foreign policy issue of the Bush presidency until the 11th of September 2001 was uh, the, uh, the um, was the the denuclearization of the United States and Russia. Uh, it was, I think, uh, uh, only this war that has put the clock back to the darkest hour of the 20th century, and we're talking about nuclear weapons again. Um, it, it is, in fact, Russia's um, narrative to bring into um, into the discourse the the Budapest Memorandum by saying, "Hey, but you had you had promised that." Uh, and now look at what Ukraine is doing. And the reason why they're doing that is that perhaps um, uh, naively Zelensky did mention, unless we get the guarantee that we're promised, then we might need to rethink the Budapest Memoranda. And I'm not even sure how uh, binding they are under international law, but I, I do not want to, to go into, into the question. So I don't think that that was... Um, that that is a um, the, the most significant development. More significant are the Minsk agreements, and this also links back to the difference between 2014 and 2022. In 2022, it became too obvious not to uh, not it, the situation became too obvious. In 2014, um, there was still an attempt, not brokered by the European Union, by the way, but by the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. To sit down on the table, find an agreement, and two agreements were found: two peace fires, two um, um, truces um, were um, were brokered, and at that time it proved uh, um, it proved insufficient. Um, um, is Russia's war about something else? Uh, that I I don't know. I don't. I cannot fathom enough uh, uh, what is going on in uh, in the decision making processes there. Um, it 
seems to be a spectacular intelligence failure if it is uh, if the assessment is correct from the outside uh, uh, there have been other spectacular failures in russian intelligence operation uh, abroad you might remember when the russian agents were were uh, caught in their in the minivan outside the um, european nuclear agency in the netherlands uh, uh, waiting the trying to to hack into their computer um, so i don't know if that is uh, if that explains some some human mistake uh, very high up uh, explains um explains the, the failure the communication failure the disorganization of the army and so on um is there so i, I don't know there is also a domestic audience that putin needs to um, appease although uh, it's easier for him since it is not um, since he doesn't face meaningful uh, election electoral uh, challenges uh, and the final question, how would the EU foreign policy change with Ukrainian membership? At the moment, I think we are still talking about something that will happen in the medium or long term, despite, uh, uh, the, despite the promises, because the practice shows that accession process takes several years um, to be uh, brought to fruition. I think it would show that, in a sense, the European Union has not only accepted a logic of political confrontation over the eastern boundary of Europe, but that Union, that the European Union has uh, has won uh, uh, that part because Ukraine has obviously chosen one side. Um, the Belarusian people seems to me are also much closer to the European Union um, than the than the current president of, of Belarus would like to think. Uh, there is a strong opposition in uh, but Belarus has a strong opposition. Um, so I think that that would be conceptually the the main uh, shift. So there is uh, um, a logic of uh, expansion, and I use the word expansion in inverted commas because it's not that the European Union is marching uh, toward uh, the East, it's that countries want to join uh, the European Union. So um, that's, uh, yes, that, that's my answer. Thank you very much. Um, Taras and then Maxi. Uh, thank you. Uh... There is another spectacular failure of, of Russian intelligence when uh, Russian spy tried to work as an intern at the International Criminal Court posing as a Brazilian citizen and was arrested by Dutch police. So there are a lot of, of interesting stories like that. Uh, if I may, I would like to comment a little bit on Budapest Memorandum and then to answer your question, Marcus. Um, actually, the Budapest Memorandum is a perfect example of how Ukraine, in fact, uh, we can say was humiliated in the 90s by the West, not, not Russia, because Ukraine was pressured essentially by the United States, by UK, uh, to give up its, its nuclear arsenal. It's not that Ukraine was not willing to do so, but they, they I mean, US and the UK were so careful in, in framing the uh, wording of the Budapest Memorandum that it doesn't even include guarantees. They provided only assurances. So essentially, Ukraine gave up its nuclear arsenal. Uh, third nuclear arsenal in the world at the time, um, essentially for nothing. So the only assurance was provided that in case Ukraine is attacked, then uh, signatories of the Budapest Memorandum will discuss uh, the ways to resolve this, this problem. So that was an empty document, basically. Uh, but somehow this is overlooked. So somehow there is more narrative on, on Russian humiliation, but not focusing on, on this aspect, for example. Uh, to answer your question, Marcus, as, as to how we see, like looking into the crystal ball and what, what we expect from uh, from the Ukrainian, Ukrainian future and the EU future, uh, and what would be um, the changes uh, for the EU foreign policy if or when Ukraine becomes a, a member. So I think... Uh, um, I think that Ukraine would lead um, the EU foreign policy in the region in the similar way as Poland and Baltic states uh, do at the moment. So they are the um, they often push the narrative, they often push the direction with regards to to neighbors. 
Uh, so I think that would be the, the role for Ukraine uh, with regards to, to Caucasus, to Moldova to a certain extent, also with, with Romania, of course, uh, to Belarus, to Russia or post-Russia or whatever will be uh, its form at the time. Um, with regards to EU accession, um, I am confident that, that it will happen. Uh, but when it will happen, a lot would also depend on Ukrainian authorities because there's still a lot of homework to be done. So essentially, this EU candidacy was, uh, sort of, I don't want to say a gift, but it was uh, it was an advance uh, taking into account the situation in Ukraine. But in order to achieve uh, uh, full membership, a lot of work uh, needs to be done by, by Ukrainian authorities. Um, so, yes, when it will happen also depends on, on us here in, in Ukraine. Uh, to bring this, this discussion a little bit back to my field, I would expect that Ukraine, after, after the, the victory, after the peace is achieved, uh, that Ukraine would lead um, international efforts in the area of criminal justice, uh, being the, the victim itself, that, that Ukraine would be similar to how the Netherlands, for example, are uh, a strong actor in, in, in this global justice politics. Um, I would like Ukraine to be uh, to be another important player in that in that regard. But again, for that we need to ratify the Rome Statute first. Just as, as one of the practical examples, so a lot will depend on on us in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maxi. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, my thought about what uh, can Ukraine bring to EU when it will be when it is a member of EU. I think that uh, uh, that uh, must be the change of the policy itself in EU. I think that there must be some uh, changing the policy, which is the policy of the end of the history, right? So this, the uh, everything is peaceful, and we do not uh, want some forces because we uh, every uh, everyone every country in the world want to to live uh, under the international law and such way. Because now we see that uh, this is just one point of view, right? We think this is right, international uh, human rights, international law, but I think that, um, I suppose that EU will change the policy and make some uh, military changes at first. So, yes, so, so I don't, I, I don't suppose that it will be maybe one country, like, yes, but maybe some changes about military forces maybe uh, something like NATO or something inside EU, but there must be such forces because uh, we can't change the world <laughs> now and uh, uh, we can't punish all the terrorist states and terrorists uh, by themselves. So, um, and of course, I uh, hope that Ukraine will bring to EU some changes uh, in uh, in a uh, sphere of IT of this uh, uh, governmental issues, you know that we we have something to give to you, right? So to change for our uh, mutual development. That's my opinion. Thanks. Thank Thank you very much. Uh, we have time. Uh, for uh, two more questions from the audience. And, and by the way, I uh, completely agree. I think um, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, membership of uh, Ukraine in the European Union is absolutely essential uh, for the future of the European Union itself. Uh, but uh, we'll discuss that. Um, I have a fantastic question uh, from our uh, mutual friend, uh, Artem uh, Chaipov. Uh, Artem, why don't you ask your question yourself? Uh, if you can turn on your video. Sure. Thank you so much, Marcus. And uh, many thanks uh, to everyone participating, contributing to this excellent discussion. 
the question um, goes as follows. It's, it's related to the EU, um, the EU's reaction uh, to Hungary, whether it was sufficient or not. Because uh, in Ukraine, a lot of people are very much concerned about uh, Hungary's stance towards Ukraine and uh, Hungary's respect uh, for the European values and policies. And I was wondering if you could comment on um, this issue and share your uh, perception as to whether the EU has enough uh, you know, legal mechanisms, political mechanisms to ensure compliance with EU values and policies vis-a-vis -vis, uh, separate member states. Thank you. Yeah, I, a fantastic uh, question, and um, I might I might chip in uh, after Luigi and and our speakers. Um, uh, we have um, another question from Maria Oshowska, who asks, um, um, who says, as as you mentioned, the main factors that suspended the EU's reactions were military and energy dependence. Do you see ways and mechanisms to prevent strong dependencies uh, like these between states off, or is it inevitable in situations like this will happen again sooner or later? Uh, two fantastic uh, questions. Um, Luigi, if you uh, could uh, One take second. a turn, and then uh, I might come back on the uh, Hungarian question as well. I sat with the Hungarian question. It's conceptually very important to address the rule of law issues because it seems to be one of the differences between a perceived us and a perceived them. Uh, the, the reason why the people of Ukraine want to join the European Union is precisely because they want to have those values they share the same uh, the same premises um, and uh, and hungary is um, um, is perceived to be uh, to be rowing in the opposite direction uh, in fact it's not just perceived to be it's also um, vetoing for the time being swedish accession to nato in addition to turkey uh, so the real and uh, he it has um, been able to negotiate a complex system of uh, derogations from the sanctions uh, when it comes to uh, energy um, to energy dependence does the eu have sufficient uh, i think it does i think it does as, as a matter of law you can find you can find it there it is difficult to avoid the um, a perception of uh, a European Union as a hostile actor against Hungary, because that is Orban's narrative, which I think is uh, is entirely uh, incorrect. I don't think that uh, the European Union and Hungary's interests are contraposed, and 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 the fight is to be is to be picked there. But in terms, the, the the question was phrased as uh, does it have enough instruments? And the answer is uh, yes. I think it has. Uh, uh, should it have better mechanisms? No, I think it already has the mechanisms for ensuring. It. And on the other question on energy dependence, uh, uh, um, energy dependence is a is a fact. It is a fact of the world that depends on uh, the um, uh, presence or or, or not of uh, resources, natural resources. So the European Union is not as rich in gas and oil as. Uh, uh, Norway or Russia or uh, Nigeria are. That this is a, a matter of fact. So, to the extent that this fact, uh, uh, geographical fact, continues, then um, and uh, an asymmetry between European Union and uh, uh, producers and exporters of oil and gas will always exist. There are mechanisms put in place to uh, modify that. Uh, the 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 green. Uh, transition being one, the energy platform being another. These are essentially uh, ways that the European Union has adopted before or during the uh, the war um, to uh, to um, to diversify the sources uh, of energy. So one way to eliminate the asymmetry is simply to say we will not rely on oil at all, or we will try to rely on renewable energies and whatnot, so things that we can produce in-house. Another way is to say instead of depending on Russia, we will depend on Algeria, which seems to be the trend. 
um, but that also carries um, political political risks, uh, the risks of depending on a country whose political uh, uh, system is not um, um, is, that does not necessarily share the same values as the European Union. Um, on the on the military, I will not answer for the for, for questions of time, but um, you you can uh, you can have a look at the book where I was mentioned this. They Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much, Artem, for your question. I I think you're you're quite rightly uh, putting the finger on uh, some of the weaknesses. Um, I myself tried to uh, answer some of those questions in Europe's second constitution, uh, my my most recent book. But um, uh, going forward, I think uh, we need to also. Um, not underestimate uh, the power, for example, of institutions beside the European Commission. So putting everything on the Commission might not be right. I think uh, the Parliament, the Council and the Court of Justice in the end have a role to play in defending the fundamental values, which sometimes seem to be um, uh, at sea. In, in some of the member states, including in ha Hungary. So I'm uh, vesting quite a bit of um, uh, confidence in the Luxembourg uh, judges uh, in this regard. And we've seen quite sweeping um, and important judgments. Um, we had uh, these two questions. I'm going back to Taras and then Maxime. Um, do we have the time? Uh, we have time how short for one minute be? answers. Yes. Um, yeah, I don't think I will. I, I, I will answer on on Hungary because I'm not an expert in EU law. Just a brief remark that I think something needs to be done because this is not sustainable way uh, to have uh, a member state who is essentially undermining uh, common values, common common policy. Uh, with regards to energy dependency and military dependency, I think um, it, at least in, with regards to military dependency, European states have learned the lessons. So now several states are increasing their, their budget, are rebuilding their armies, uh, because for decades, everyone believed that there will be no big war, so we don't need big armies. And apparently big war can, can still happen on the European continent. Uh, same with the energy dependency. I think that the, the diversification is, is the answer here. And of course, uh, there are some natural and geographical limits that if you don't have oil resources, then, then you will not find oil resources uh, on, within your territories. But even with energy dependency on Russia, there were ways to minimize the threat from, from Russia. So for example, uh, when Ukraine tried to point down to the fact that these Nord Stream pipelines, that they are not economic tools or economic mechanisms, but essentially political uh, mechanisms to, to put pressure on Ukraine to kind of further the, the, the pressure on Ukraine that no one in Germany listened because all Germany wanted was cheap gas and, and, and sorry, but, but Germany didn't care enough uh, about security risks for Ukraine. Should there be no, no Nord Stream pipelines and, and all the gas would go through Ukraine or, or Belarus as it used to be before, then Russia would be much more cautious uh in its uh use of force against ukraine uh, so yeah i think uh thinking beyond uh short-term economic gains is is key in this in this regard can we agree more uh maxime uh, yes about the uh, um, dependence um i can say that this is the case about what i said uh, earlier about the end or the end of history right so the EU countries, and not only EU countries, but, but EU, EU, European countries, I think that they must uh, change their politics, po po policy, right, to uh, to stay uh, more strength, right, to strengthen their their military and uh, and their energetically energetic uh, policies for such a such um, language. Um, so it, it, I think it must be done, and I suppose that European countries uh, already uh, understood it. Um, about uh, Hungary, um, I think that uh, that uh, this is the same question about the sovereignty, because uh, um, Orban uh, is quite similar to Putin, right? 
I think the, the case why did not Orban uh, uh, put uh, its military uh, to Ukraine is about just uh, Ukrainian forces and uh, uh, that uh, Hungary is smaller than Ukraine. Because we have to remember that Orban, uh, quite uh, before the full-scale invasion, was in Moscow. So <laughs> I can't uh, remember what, why was he a day or two before the full-scale invasion, right? Maybe 23 or 20, 23rd or 22nd of uh, February 2022. So the, his uh, not only him, but several days ago, or yesterday, or several days ago, uh, military, um, I think, uh, Minister of Defense of Hungary said that uh, in the Second World War, there uh, uh, had to be some negotiations with Hitler. So how can we accept it? I don't know. Yes, he said it, and Poland already said that, <laughs> what are you saying? Yeah. So. Now, so now he is talking about that there, there had to be an aggression with Hitler and the world world second wouldn't happen here, yeah, right? So like it was. So I think that uh, Europe and EU must somehow react at it because it is a violation of the principles of EU and human rights. Thanks. Thank you very much, Maxime. And I think we all recognize that it's not just uh, undermining Ukraine's uh, security, it undermines the security of many EU states, including the Baltic states and uh, Poland, but also uh, in theory, Eastern Germany, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, and and the former um, uh, states of uh, Yugoslavia. I mean, this, uh, you know, compromising on, on these items would uh, be really, really dangerous for the European Union itself. Thank you very much. On behalf of uh, the Center for European Legal Studies here at the University of Cambridge, um, this was a fantastic uh, discussion and hopefully just the start of a fruitful collaboration. The last word in this uh, webinar uh, goes to Natalia. It is my pleasure to say thank you to all participants, to Luigi, to Luigi, to you, Marcos, for organizing this wonderful event on behalf of the Ukrainian Catholic University School of Law. And indeed, at the UQ, we always say values come first. And, and I think it's, it's good words to finalize our today's discussions, that values are very important for shaping legal provisions. And with that in mind, I'd like to thank you all participants for very interesting questions. I think this is a very fruitful discussion, which can result maybe in some publications in the future. Thank you very much. And with that, we end our webinar, but we start our collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. The best.